Live from the BDN Studios, it's Bang and Dang. That's awesome. If you don't like that, then you ain't black. Welcome back to Battles of the American Civil War with your host Bang and Dang coming back at you with some more Overland campaign action as well as some Atlanta campaign action. And we're uh, getting into the Lynchburg campaign, which uh, is taking place in Virginia the same time as the Overland campaign. And we got a... Uh, Sweet Virginia. Got a little battle. I think it's... What is it? Uh, Was it Mississippi or Arkansas? Yeah, we got one in Arkansas today. Um, oh, that's nice. So, yeah, good stuff coming on here. Four battles. Battle of Piedmont, Old River Lake, Marietta, First Petersburg, which uh, Marietta is not even really a battle, but something important does happen. It's a series of battles. Some battles we'll get to here in like a couple episodes, but it's a start of a series of battles, but something important happens at the Marietta one that uh, we're going to discuss, oh. and yeah, big blow for the Confederates, let's just say that. Oh, um, <laughs> right. Before we get started, go check out our YouTube at Bang Dang Network on YouTube, <laughs> where we post shorts, clips, full episodes, and our YouTube exclusive Dart League, if you're listening on Spotify, Apple. Well, we don't post shorts. Right. Well, we used to. Sometimes we will. <laughs> Uh, Spotify, Apple, answer that Spotify question. Share us with your friends. Give us a review. And uh, check out our Discord. It'll be in the description. Oh, with that, nice. we're going to start out with the Battle of Piedmont. Battle of Piedmont's in the, over, or the Lynchburg campaign. Oh, that's nice. So I don't think we have any Overland campaign today, actually, guys. Sorry. Um, but we're going to start out with the Battle of Piedmont. Fought June 5th, 1864, at the same time that the Battle of Cold Harbor of the Overland campaign is going on. Which took place village of Piedmont, Augusta County, Virginia. Okay. Union Major General David Hunter engaged Confederates under Brigadier General William E. Grumble Jones north of Piedmont. The Battle of Piedmont. <laughs> How many times can I say Piedmont? <laughs> right. Uh, resulted from Lieutenant General Ulysses S. Grant, 84th, 1864 initiative to keep U.S. forces on the offensive and prevent Confederates from shuttling troops from one region to another. In the Shenandoah Valley, Grant had originally placed German-born Franz Siegel in command. Oh, Franz. However, after he failed at the Battle of Newmarket on May 15th, Grant relieved him and replaced him with Major General David Hunter. Oh, that's fantastic. In uh, command of the United States Army of the Shenandoah on May 21st. Oh. Hunter quickly regrouped his... Hunter, Hunter quickly regrouped his small army and ordered his troops to live off the bountiful farms of the Shenandoah Valley. Oh, I'm bountiful. Uh, yeah, stealing from the fucking people. Right. He advanced up the valley towards Staunton on uh, May 26th against light opposition from the Confederates. Following New Market, the majority of the Confederate forces in the valley joined the Army of Northern Virginia, leaving only Brigadier General John D. Imboden's brigade and the valley reserves to confront Hunter. Oh. Uh -oh. Well, ain't that fantastic? Well, in Bowdoin, he kept Robert E. Lee informed of Hunter's movements, but could do little to slow Hunter down with his meager forces. A little meager man. Right. <laughs> Hunter set his sights on Staunton and in Port Railroad and logistics centers for the old rebels. He's like, yeah, take these bad boys out. The quick union advanced upon the heels of their defeat at New Market, caught the old rebels off guard. Closely engaged with the Army of the Potomac, Lee turned to General Brigadier General William Grumble Jones, which was the acting commander of the Confederate Department of Southwest Virginia and East Tennessee for assistance. Okay, too long. All right. He's like, I need some assistance, bud. What can you do? What do you need me to do? Well, I need you to open communications with the Biden. Jones soon went to the Shenandoah with roughly 4,000 infantry and dismounted cavalrymen. So infantry. Uh, by June 3rd, the Union Army had reached Harrisonburg. And Bowden had concentrated his forces at Mount Crawford on the south bank of the North River. South Bank of the North River, right. blocking Hunter's direct path to Staunton upon the Valley Turnpike. Uh oh. In Bowdoin, a Valley native from Augusta County, established his headquarters at the Grattan House, uh -oh. where his force grew and the reinforcements began to arrive from Southwest Virginia. Oh, shit. Morning of June 4th, Hunter sent a diversionary force towards Mount Crawford while his main army headed east to Port Republic, where he camped for the night. General Jones had arrived at the Grattan House and assumed command of the hastily assembled Confederate Army of the Valley District. Fantastic. Well, that's nice. What does that look like? Oh, nice little house there. Homestead, huh? All right. What is that? Decent. A nice little farm field in front of it. A little corn. It's okay, man. I like it. All right. When the old Reb scouts reported Hunter's flank march, and Bowden suggested that they move to Maury's Hill in eastern Augusta to confront Hunter. According to Bowden, Jones agreed to march his infantry and dismount cavalry to Maury's Hill in eastern Augusta, where they would confront Hunter on the 5th of June. <laughs> we got to confront this guy. Right. Jones ordered him Bowden to lead all the mounted troops toward Mount Meridian, a few miles south of Port Republic on the Staunton or the East Road. 
Quench them assume it's God today. Maybe. Right. Jones <laughs> Jones added that Imboden was to delay Hunter's advance, but instructed Imboden to avoid any serious competition when the old federales approached the next morning. He's like, you can slow him down, but do not, do no, not no, 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 engage no, 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 fully. Any serious competition here, guys. After spending a rainy night in Canada, I love a rainy night. It's such a beautiful sight. I don't, I don't think these Port guys Republic. love it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but after spending a rainy night and camped on the southern outskirts of Port Republic, Hunter's army marched southward on the Staunton Road towards Mount Meridian through the morning mist. Major General Julius Stahels, Stahels, Stahels Cavalry led the advance, driving back in Bowdoin's outpost. When Stahels advance regiment reached Mount Meridian and Bowdoin, <laughs> and Bowdoin successfully counterattacked with the 18th hey, Virginia Cavalry. Look at this guy. Stahel fed reinforcements into the fight and quickly overwhelmed the Virginians. Yeah, so, seen that coming. And Bowdoin barely escaped capture, and the only and only the timely charge from balance of his brigade, which included local reserves, saved the 18th Virginia from disaster. Oh. Good for you, uh, local reserves. All right, the old Rebs fell back slowly toward the village of Piedmont. And Bowdoin expected to join forces with General Jones at Maury Hill. But was surprised to find him at Piedmont. That worked out, right? I guess. The two commanders debated the situation. And then Jones, who ranked above Imboden, decided to stand and fight. Good for you, Jones. He's like, you don't even know what happened back there. He's like, nah, I think we got it, bud. We seen it. Well, we're going to see it again. Put you guys in the front line. <laughs> <laughs> Jones advanced a battalion of dismounted cavalry. Conv- convalescence. Convalescence is a person who is recovering. Oh, after an illness or operation. What? So he's setting out injured and illness, guys. I mean, that's all he got. So guys, you got to do what you got to do. Wow. So Jones sent out a battalion of dismounted cavalry and a bunch of freaking crips. <laughs> and he detailed and detailed men several hundred yards in front of his left wing, backed by a section of horse artillery. And then Stahl's advance was stopped. All right. Good for them. All right. Look at that. Good for you, Jones. <laughs> right. Stand and fight, baby. Yeah. Um, Jones deployed his two brigades of infantry, his left wing, that he was ready to go. He did that along the edge of a woodlot that ran from the Staunton or East Road to uh, the high bluffs of the Middle River that anchored his left flank. Right. Then ordered, he just keeps on going, right? Right. You say, well, or uh, in Bowdoin, I want you to guard my extreme right flank with the cavalry. On Imboden's immediate left, Brigadier General John C. Vaughn's brigade of dismounted Tennessee and Georgia horsemen went into position. Vaughn's left flank rested 600 yards to the rear of Jones's right wing, creating a gap in the center of his line. Ooh. Do you think that the dismounted cavalrymen, when they ran, they were like they running like, like, like galloped? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm used to it. And they're like, legs are spread wide because they're used to being on horseback. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> and then when they stop, they act like the horse is bucking or something. They're like, <laughs> they're like <laughs> that's all right. They keep like digging their hoofs in the, in the ground. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, that created a gap in the one, center of his line. And one of their, uh, one, one of their, uh, One of the soldiers that they're riding with, they come with an apple. I was just going to say, like, an oat cake or something. <laughs> and, like, start brushing each other's hair. <laughs> uh, yeah, that gap in the center of his line, by the way, is what formed. But there he positioned two batteries, which included Captain... <clears throat> they had batteries back then? Yeah. Captain Marquise's reserve artillery, manned by 17- and 18-year-olds of Augusta County. Uh-oh. Don't want the little guys doing that. Well, Hunter's chief of staff, Colonel David Hunter Strother, he described the battlefield as this... The enemy's position was strong and well chosen. It was on a conclave of wooden hills, commanding an open valley between an open, gentle slopes in front. On our right, in advance of the village of Piedmont, was a line of log and rail defenses, very advantageously located in the edge of a forest and just behind the rise of a smooth, open hill, so that the troops moving over this hill could be mowed down by musketry from the works at the short range. Nice. And to prevent artillery from being used against them. Look at that. The left flank of this palisade rested on a steep and impractical bluff, 60 feet high, Jeez. and washed at its base by the Shenandoah. Oh, all right. Well, good hell for yeah. the cavalry a, or uh, Confederates. It's a hell of a uh, breastwork there. Right. Huh? At noon, Hunter's infantry under the command of Brigadier General Jeremiah C. Sullivan advanced. Colonel Augustus Moore's brigade drove in Jones's advance line. Isn't Sullivan uh, Irish? Oh, Sullivan. Colonel Augustus Moore's brigade drove in uh, Jones's advance line on the west side of the Staunton Road, halted along the edge of the wooded lot opposed 
opposite the one Jones's Confederates were stationed in. Sullivan ordered an advance, but the well-protected rebel infantry repulsed the effort. Mm. On the east side of the road, Colonel Joseph Thoburn's brigade advanced to a wooded ravine towards Imboden's position under heavy artillery fire. Thoburn withdrew to support the Union artillery when he saw Moore's repulse. He was like, oh shit. During these actions, the Union artillery under Captain Henry DuPont systematically silenced most of the Confederate guns. Look at them. Mm. Well, only a few guns with Imboden on the extreme Confederate right remained active. At this point, Jones decided to withdraw his left wing so that it was aligned with Vaughn and Imboden. But events soon changed his mind. <laughs> Sullivan, he reinforced Moore with two regiments and ordered another attack, but was once again repulsed by the old ribs. This time, the ribs counterattacked, but a stand by the 28th Ohio and some dismounted horsemen armed with Spencer repeating rifles. I mean, you get those sons of bitches. You get 10 people with repeating rifles. That's equivalent to uh, 100 to 150, right? Um. You're telling me uh, all these battles the Confederates won and they didn't get any repeating rifles from these guys? They got to have some, right? Right. Right. Oh, and and uh, plus the 28th Ohio was backed by a second section of artillery, and which forced the old Southerners to fall back to their breastworks. Mm. And emboldened Jones now rearranged his forces. Emboldened, to, emboldened. Emboldened, emboldened. <laughs> he rearranged his forces to launch a concerted attack against Moore's battered brigade. Jones, has ordered, Jones ordered Vaughn to advance the greater part of his brigade to the left wing. 60th Virginia Infantry moved from its position in the edge of the woods, covering the large gap in the center of his battle line. The Virginians ended up in a second line of battle behind the main Confederate line, leaving the gap completely undefended. Ooh, but if they did their job, they'd be all right. Uh, well, I don't know, maybe. Jones's concentration of troops against Moore's brigade did not go unnoticed. Sh- shouldn't have. The old Federale spotted the gap on the right flank of Jones's right, le- I mean, left wing. And then Hunter ordered <laughs> right. And then Hunter ordered Thoburn's brigade to attack the vulnerable rebel line. Thoburn quickly advanced to within a few yards of the old rebels left before his men were spotted and shattered the southern flank. Oh shit. At this very time, Moore's brigade joined the assault against the old rebel front. Jones' attempt to retreat the situation bringing up the Valley Reserves, who slowed Thoburn's advance, but were unable to throw it back. Mm, Jones mm. then dashed up to a small group of rallying Confederates and then charged towards the oncoming Union infantry. Oh, shit. A Union bullet struck him in the head, <gasps> killing him instantly. No oh, shit. Oh, Grumble. Oh, Grumble Jones. Damn. Well, that's two big losses, actually. If you, we'll, we'll get to the other one. Holy the Union shit. forces drove the Confederates towards the bluffs of the Middle River, splitting the Confederate force into two. Oh, wow. They're at, done. At the bluffs, the converted forces of Thoburn's and Moore's Brigade, backed by some of Stahlhell's cavalry, captured nearly a 1,000 unwounded Confederates. Uh-oh. Section of Captain John McClanahan's Virginia horse. McClan- There's a little Irish guy for you. Right. Uh, his horse, Virginia horse artillery, stood its ground near the village of Piedmont, slowing the Union drive southward and barely evading capture. Oh. Hmm. Wow. On the Staunton Road, which is East Road now, the 1st New York Veteran Cavalry launched a vigorous pursuit of the beaten old ribs. However, another section of McClanahan's battery, an element of Vaughn's brigade, not sent to the left, hastily deployed along the road between the villages of Piedmont and New Hope. <laughs> when the old New Yorkers chased up the road after fleeing Southerners, uh, this old rebel rear guard opened fire, which devastated the Union cavalry and dampened their enthusiasm for any further pursuit. Like, like, man, maybe we don't want to pursue these guys. Like, anymore. don't you think we did enough? <laughs> <laughs> Although at least fifteen hundred Confederates had been lost, the rear guard action at New Hope allowed the remnants of the army to escape further damage. Bond learned that he was now the senior officer as a result of Jones's death, but he was unfamiliar with the Shenandoah Valley and simply adopted in Bowden's recommendations. Right. Hunter's army rounded up the prisoners and tended to the wounded at Piedmont, where the army of the Shenandoah camped for the night, having lost nearly 900 men killed and wounded. Damn. That next day, it became the first Union army to enter Staunton. Oh, Look at that. shit. Wow. Private Thomas Evans, 54th Pennsylvania Infantry, shot a old rebel officer rallying the old rebels. He battled the color bearer of the 45th Virginia and captured the flag from him. Good oh, yeah. Hand to hand Yeah, you're going to fight a guy that has no weapons. Magician uh, James Schnedden of the 54th Pennsylvania Infantry, he picked up a rifle and joined the attack. There you go. And he went along to capture Colonel Buring Jones, commander of the 1st Confederate Infantry Brigade. This guy, a fucking mm-hmm. musician. They killed the Jones and they captured the Jones. Right. Major General Julius Stahl. Uh, ain't no, uh, they, uh, I, I, uh, one could say they kept up with the Joneses. <laughs> <laughs> They're Jones and Fur Jones. <laughs> <laughs> Major General Julius Stahl was struck by two bullets as he led his dismounted cavalry into that bay. 
<laughs> he had the wounds dressed at a field hospital and returned to direct the final cavalry charge. Good for him, buddy. All right. Look at that. Finally, a, uh, uh, the Union Army doing something good here. All right. For that, well, it's going to lead us to the Battle of Old River Lake. Oh. Which is also known as Ditch Bayou, Furlough, and Fish Bayou. I like Old River Lake. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. Ditch Bayou is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was a small skirmish, obviously, on June 5th to the June 6th, 1864. Union Army Force marched into Confederate-held lands in Chicot County, Arkansas. Uh-oh. The Confederate objective was to delay the Federal advance. Okay, obviously. <laughs> although, they had, although they had no real hope of defeating the Federal forces in a major battle, by using small-scale skirmishing techniques, they were able to slowly inflict casualties on the Union right. Army. They knew that's the way to go. Using these skirmishing techniques, the old rebel attempted to delay the Union advance toward Lake Village. Early June, Brigadier General Joseph Mauer received orders from Major General Andrew Smith to show, through a forceful demonstration, the Federale's intentions toward Lake Village. He's like, you show us what you show them what we want to do. Mm-hmm. Like this is what's going to happen. Right. You don't either retreat or give up. All right. During the evening and morning of 5th June, 6th June, Mauer, he positioned his troops in the standard marching formation and proceeded to march on Lake Village. They were soon confronted by rebel soldiers who would fire a few shots and retreat to cover. <laughs> pew, pew. Uh, later, these retreating soldiers ended up in General Colton Green's encampment, where his main force was located. Oh. Along with Green's troops and accompanying artillery, the Confederates attempted to delay the Federal advance, then ended the battle and withdrew to Parker's Landing. Oh. The Union troops advanced to Lake Village, camped there overnight, and the next day rejoined the flotilla on the Mississippi River at Columbia. So Although the nothing. Confederates had been able to delay the Federal forces, the U.S. troops still made it to their objective. Right. They did nothing. Which was uh, Lake Village. So. They and they knew they were going right. to They are just trying to delay them a little bit, you know I mean? <sighs> well, that was pointless. All right. Moving on. Battle of... That wasn't pointless for the Federals. They did what they were going to do. Right. Uh, Moving on. Battle of Marietta. It was a series of military operations from the 9th of June to the July 3rd of 1864. This happened in Cobb County, Georgia. Georgia! (laughs) Georgia. Several engagements were fought during this four-week period, including the Battles of Pine Mountain on the 14th of June, Gilgal Church at the 15th, Kolb's Farm on the 22nd. Cobb's Farm, uh, we'll have that coming up. And Kennesaw Mountain on the 27th of June. We'll also have that coming up. Oh, Sherman forced Johnston to withdraw. Hey, we're going back to these guys, huh? Sherman. Sherman forced Johnston from the old Rebs. Atlanta campaign. All right, Sherman with the, with the Union and Johnston with the old Rebs. Right. He forced Johnston to withdraw partially on June 18th. To protect his supply lines, but the old blue coach forces were not fully victorious until the day before Independence right, Day. This is where it gets rough for the old Confederates because June 14th, 1864, Confederate General Leonidas Polk, second cousin of former President James K. Polk, was he was a cousin, sc- yeah, sure. was scouting enemy positions near Marietta, Georgia, with a staff when he was killed in action oh, by a federal Leonidas Polk three inch shell at Pine Mountain. What? The artillery fire was initiated when Sherman spotted a cluster of Confederate officers, Polk, William J. Hardy, Johnston, and their staffs in an exposed area. You guys shouldn't be in an exposed area. You guys are three fucking generals, dude. Damn, and they got Polk? They could have got uh, Hardy. Well, they tried to get them all. <laughs> he pointed them out to Major General Oliver Howard, commander wow. of the 4th Corps, and ordered him to fire on them. The 15th Indiana Battery, or the 5th Indiana Battery, 5th Indiana Battery, commanded by Captain Peter Simonson, obeyed the order within minutes. First round came close, and a second even closer, causing the men to disperse. Third shell struck Polk's left arm, went through his chest, and exited, hit in his right arm, then exploded against a tree, cutting Polk nearly in two. Dude, yeah, he's done. Dead. Dead. Holy shit, he was just out of... Dead. Right. Why are you guys meeting around in an open area? Right. Idiots. Idiots. Don't worry, uh, we'll learn more about old Leonidas Polk here. Old Leonidas, huh? Uh, Man, that sucked for old Polk. Yeah, well, it sucked for the Confederates all right. together because they just lost Grumble and uh, Leonidas wow. today. Well, That's this episode, crazy. anyways, right? Wow. Moving on from that shocker, right. <laughs> Battle of Petersburg, the first battle of Petersburg. 
was an unsuccessful blue-collar assault against the Earthworks fortification, the Demonic Line. <laughs> <laughs> the Dimock Line. Dimock. Yeah. The Dimock Line protecting the city of Petersburg, Virginia. This happened on the 9th of June in the year of 1864. And During it happened. The wow. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because of the ragtag group of defenders involved, it's sometimes known as the Battle of Old Men and Young Boys. Yeah. Right. Oh, leave my pants on. Very <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. You're ungrateful. Uh, you must confess. Right. <laughs> Confession. Seven Hail Marys. Call me in a moment. Yeah. Seven Hail Marys. Go in my dressing room. <laughs> what do you got in the dressing room? <laughs> Just got a bed in. Right. <laughs> in early June, Lieutenant uh, General Ulysses S. Grant and General Robert E. Lee, they are engaged in an overland campaign, shall, wow. facing each other in a, uh, their trenches after the bloody Battle of Cold Harbor. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, Major General Benjamin Butler, he was balled up in the Bermuda Hundred, uh, which was east of Richmond, attempting to distract Lee by attacking Richmond. Yeah, well, Butler realized that Richmond was supplied by railroads, which you should have known. <laughs> Is that uh, city supplied by railroads? Right, uh, that, that converged in the city of Petersburg to the south, and that taking Petersburg would cripple Lee's supply lines. He was also aware that Confederate troops had been moving north to reinforce Lee, leaving the defenses of Petersburg in a vulnerable state. Oh, sure. Sensitive to his failure in the Bermuda 100 campaign, yeah, he failed. Butler sought to achieve a success to vindicate his generalship. Mm-hmm. He wrote, The capture of Petersburg laid near my heart. Petersburg was protected by fortifications known as the Dimmick, Dimmock Line, a line of earthworks 10 miles long east of the city, including 55 artillery batteries and anchored on the Appomattox River. Uh, 55 artillery batteries? How many guns overall? There's got to be hundreds, right? 2,500 Confederate stretched thin along this v- defensive line. They were commanded by former uh, uh, Virginia governor, Brigadier General Henry Wise. The overall defense of Richmond and Petersburg was a responsibility of P.G. Beauregard. You're like, you're like their last one, bud. <laughs> right. He's the commander of the North Carolina and Southern Virginia. Butler's plan was formulated on the afternoon of 8th of June, 1864, calling for three columns to cross the Appomattox and advance from City Point, which is now named Hopewell, Virginia. All you guys in Hopewell, Virginia, boo-hoo-hoo, right? They had about 4,500 men with old uh, Butler. The first and second consisted of infantry from Major General Quincy Gilmore's 10th Corps and U.S. Colored Troops from Brigadier General Edward Hanks' 3rd Division of the 18th Corps, which would attack the demonic line east of the city. <laughs> Demock. Demock. The third was 1,300 cavalrymen under Brigadier General August Kotz, who would sweep around Petersburg and strike it from the southeast. If any of these three forces made a breakthrough, it would be able to move into the rear of the defenders opposing the other two. Butler originally designated Hinks to command the operation, but Gilmore insisted that he was a senior officer, and Butler later complained, I was fool enough to yield to him. Right. So that pretty much tells you what's about to happen. Right. Well, the troops moved out on the night of 8th of June, but made poor progress. <laughs> the column of Gilmore's infantry got lost in the dark. <laughs> Although Hinks arrived on time, he was ordered to wait for the Gilmore. Gilmore. <laughs> so, that all, so that all the infantry could cross before the cavalry. Eventually, well, I mean, it's ideal, yeah. It's right. Like probably want your infantry out there first. Right. Eventually, the infantry crossed by 3.40 a.m. on the 9th of June and were ordered to move forward against the enemy's picket line at daylight. 7 a.m., both Gilmore and Hanks had encountered the enemy, but they stopped at their fronts. Well, Gilmore, who was an engineer and officer with no experience leading troops in combat, Uh-oh. hesitated at the sight of the formidable earthwork. I didn't know what to do. Hinks also felt that the Confederate defenses were too strong and that he could not move forward unless Gilmore attacked with him. Right. Gilmore told Hinks that he would attack, but that both of the infantry columns should await the cavalry assault from the south. Right. I mean, makes sense, I guess. So, yeah, I like that. Colts' men had not arrived until noon, mm. having been delayed en route by numerous enemy pickets. Oh, they got delayed. That's a good delay work right. there. I mean, it's not like you were slacking or something. You right. To fight through some people. Right. They assaulted the Dimmick Line where it crossed the Jerusalem Plank Road, which is present day U.S. Route 301. 301. At, at Battery 27, also known as Rive Salient, with the 150 militiamen they had, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Fletcher Archer. <laughs> I mean, what a manly uh, he was manning two artillery lunettes. I'm Fletcher Archer. Right. Couch is launched. Couch launched a probing attack by the 5th Pennsylvania Cavalry against the militiamen. And he then paused and ordered his men to dismount. He's like, you know what? 
Let's show these guys who we really are. Right. Well, Get off those damn horses. Confederate Brigadier General Raleigh Colston, who happened to be within the city without a in a <laughs> without assignment at the time. Well, he was like, screw it. I'm going to bring up uh, the 12-pounder howitzer oh, to sure. fire at the Union Cavalrymen, but found that he had no anti-personnel rounds. Oh, my God. Colson retreated under pressure as a fifth, uh, Pennsylvania Cavalry, the 1st District of Columbia Cavalry, and the 11th Pennsylvania. Oh, damn, D.C. had their own cavalry? It's just like the first time we're hearing about any of that. Um, and the 11th Pennsylvania Cavalry began to flank him. Oh, shit. Coutts then launched his main attack by the 11th Pennsylvania against the Home Guard, which was a group consisting of primarily of teenagers, elderly men, and some wounded soldiers from city hospitals. Right, so it was garbage. Well, the Home Guards retreated as they should. Uh, right. They did that. They went to the city with heavy losses. But by this time, Beauregard had been able to bring reinforcements from Richmond. He had the 4th North Carolina Cavalry, part of the 7th Confederate States Cavalry. Oh, look at yeah. that shit. That was from Bermuda 100 line. Jeez, these motherfuckers been fighting for all this time, and they're like, shit. And he had an artillery battery as well. They were able to repulse the Union assault. Colts, hearing no activity on Gilmore's front, presumed that he was left on his own, and he withdrew. Yeah, Gilmore's a bitch. Yeah, Confederate casualties were about 80, Union had about 40. Oh. Butler was furious with Gilmore's timid timidity and incompetence and arrested him. Oh, shit. Gilmore requested a court of inquiry, which was never convened, but Grant later reassigned him, and the incident was dropped. What? So we'll just get rid of him, like, put him right. in the desk or something. <laughs> right. Uh, June 14th to the 17th, Grant and the Army of the Potomac slipped away from Lee and crossed the James River. Oh. They began moving towards Petersburg to support and renew Butler's assaults. Oh, wow. Which the Second Battle of Petersburg and the Siege of Petersburg would soon follow. Yeah, the Siege of Petersburg. Is, Petersburg. <laughs> the Petersburg National Battlefield covers only part of the battlegrounds around Petersburg. The American Battlefield Trust and its partners have preserved 131 additional acres of the Petersburg Battlefield through mid-2023. Well, ain't that fantastic. Ain't that fantastical. All right. So really nothing much accomplished there except for uh, the first battle of Piedmont. Yeah, yeah Piedmont some did some things. About it. I mean, this war's over with. Yeah, they're just holding on for dear life here. They got two more of their good generals fucking killed. Lee knows it, too. <clears throat> He's just hoping to get that one chance. He's waiting for that one chance where he, he can catch, uh, catch Grant slipping, but he ain't going to get it. Maybe get an important battle. Well, they do get the second battle of Petersburg. Right. Done. Yep. It's over. Done, done, done. But we're not done because next week we have the Battle of Bryce's Crossroads in Mississippi coming up next week, as well as the Battle of Cynthiana. Cynthiana, yeah, which is in Kentucky. So we've got a couple new uh, places we haven't been in a while. Then we'll most likely have the Battle of Trevilian Station in Virginia, which is part of that overland campaign. Yeah, the old Revs are uh, on a stretch from the 9th to the 18th of June, about to get the morale back somewhat. They're going to get some victories under their belts. Yeah. Next week, we'll probably end with that Trevilian they get, Station. They get three B battles and an A battle in a matter of weeks. That's fantastic. Look at these guys. And then uh, the week after next, we'll probably have the battle, second battle of Petersburg, the battle of Lynchburg, and that aforementioned battle of Cherbourg, where uh, outside of France, sinking of the CSS Alabama. And then we got a whole bunch of other stuff, and then Confederates going on a little run here. So, got a lot of stuff coming up here on the old battles of the American Civil War. And it sucks, too, because the, uh, the old Rebs were hoping that Alabama would come back home we with hoping. much needed supplies, and, and it didn't happen. What happened to the, uh, were they, did they become prisoners? Oh, I don't know. I guess we'll see, won't we? Right. 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 <laughs> uh, yeah, I got a lot of more Virginia and Georgia's. Cause Georgia! Both, both of these campaigns are far from over. Um, um, yeah, so we got a lot of good stuff coming up here. Reminder, YouTube, check it out, at Bang Dang Network, Spotify, Apple, answer the question, rear view us, share with your friends, Discord link in the description, and we'll be back next week for more Battle Dude, of the Americans of the War. This Overland campaign put a lot of damage. Yeah. You got the Wilderness, Todd's Tavern, Spotsylvania Courthouse. Oh, my. Tadatapadatomi Creek. Boy. Cold Harbor. Oh, my. Uh, and that's in the same areas. Where they've already battled for the last three years, dude. They're fucking laying. I'm surprised there's anything left. We'll see you next week. Battles of the Mercy of War with Mother Michigan. Bing, dang.